So I am now going to call the Longmont Housing Authority Board of Commissioners regular meeting in order. Um, let's have a roll call, please. Uh, Chair Joan Pett. Commissioner Rodriguez. Uh, Commissioner Vidalgo Perrin. Commissioner Martin. Commissioner Tomars. Commissioner Yabro. Interim Executive Director Harold Rodriguez. Uh, Regional Manager Lisa Gallinar. County Supervisor Timber Dennis. Sarah Reeve Oak Safety. Molly O'Donnell. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Molly O'Donnell, Housing Director. Tracy D. Francesco, Housing Compliance Manager. Great, thank you. Um, we now have the review and approval of the minutes. People behind us? Oh. Right. Yeah. Take long, this is easy. Would you make so you're hurry? I will add that um, Tim, I think he said this before, if he didn't, um, we funded the attorney position for the housing work, and Tim is filling that. So he shifted in for it. Congratulations. He's LHA in house. In city in house for affordable housing. housing yeah. So he's LHA general housing. <coughs> yeah. Do I have a motion for the approval of the January 31st? So moved. Second. It's been moved by Councilor uh, Commissioners Martin, seconded by Commissioner Yardwell. Um, is there any discussion on those motions? All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed? I'll abstain because I was not present at that meeting. So that passes with one abstention by uh, Commissioner Roberts. We are the public invited to be heard. Questions? Anybody in the public that would like to speak? Yes, you are three minutes. And what is your name? That is My name is, uh, should I stand up? Yeah. My name is Huck Walk. Um, I live at 1272 Mullins Peak Avenue. And I've talked to many of the commissioners uh, about this topic. But um, back in January 2021, um, the City Council passed a uh, ban on using ADUs as short-term rentals um, but I uh, it is still allowed to have a short-term rental in a single-family home so I could for example take my rental that has a family of three living in it and I could pick them out and turn that into a short-term rental however I cannot uh, carve out a space in my own home or in my backyard to build an ADU and run that in the short-term rental uh, just trying to understand why the former is okay and the latter is not okay. Um, especially when I feel like uh, ADUs are the perfect place for short-term rentals. Um, you might not like short-term rentals, but we do want to have out-of-town people come in to Longmont. Some of those people prefer short-term rentals over hotels. And ADUs are perfect because the homeowner is on site, can uh, manage that, make sure that the guests are um, being good guests and good neighbors, parking where they need to be, putting trash where they need to be, um, and that sort of thing. So um, again, my, my main question is why are short-term rentals allowed in single family homes and taking up these larger spaces that families can live in uh, while you can't use an ADU as a short-term rental, especially when some people rely on that for um, affordability of their home when they're on a fixed income and need that extra income. So thank you very much. Thank you. And this might be, um, if you could present this at a regular session, it's public invited to be heard. That might be uh, better because this is just all on top of Right. And I, I have done that. Okay. Yeah. I can share you my three minutes that I did that. Thank you. I figured it would be useful for the housing situation. I think there's a shortage of housing. It's getting used up in the. Uh, Thank you. So um, going back, I skipped the agenda revisions and submissions of documents. Do we have any, uh, I don't see any agenda revisions, but do any of the commissioners have any submission of documents? Just in one, two, uh, this one, the staff has a recommendation. That's okay. Right? Okay. Yes. Um, the property tax exemption partnership policy in your hard copy packets that you have here, you have a uh, version with a red line on it. 
some late changes came in based on some uh, attorney suggestions that came in this morning. So there is a red line version in your packet as well, and that's what we would like to discuss for item 5A. I'll go right to item 5A, which is not on the bottom line, right? It's, yeah. it's under agenda revision. Oh, it's under agenda revision? Okay. So I'm going to be presenting on this tonight, Molly O'Donnell, Housing Director. Um, the existing property tax exemption partnership policy was put into place a, a year ago, February 2022. Um, this was something that was put into a place ahead of the anticipated development projects that were most active in 2022, Chris Lynn too, being the, the heaviest one. Um, we wanted to make sure that we had a policy in place for calculating the partnership fee um, that would be required. And what we have since learned through research and experience going through developments in the last year is that, that our property tax exemption partnership policy should really be expanded to be more all-encompassing of everything that goes into that partnership. So. Um, in order for the housing authority to become, to, to enter into that partnership, we have to enter the ownership structure as a special limited partner. So we wanted to make sure that this was clear, that that was the mechanism to become that partner and allow those private developments that are affordable housing, um, but not sponsored by the housing authority to benefit from tax property tax exemption. Um, so we wanted to make sure that was clear. We also have been hit up in the last year by several developers of new buildings, new affordable housing units, and some existing affordable housing providers asking about our property tax exemption partnership policy and how they could gain access to it. Um, it really is, these types of policies are something that are very common in housing authorities. And it's really a very attractive, um, attractive carrot for developers that are that are looking around at communities and where they want to build affordable housing. And this is one of the things they really rely on to make performance work and make the financing work. And um, so they're all very interested in what what the fees look like and how the structures would come together and that type of thing. So in hearing some of their arguments for what they would like. We really thought that clarifying our policy and how we're going to evaluate those projects was important and um, confirm, well, confirm and be more detailed about our fees and how we collect them, how we calculate them um, based on the value of the, the benefit to the community that that project brings. And um, for those that are already on the tax rolls, and have not benefited from this policy, but are providing affordable housing. Uh, they're looking for ways to benefit from property tax exemption. Um, and so we wanted to build in a way for that to be considered, but also weighed against the pros and cons of losing tax revenue in the community for the benefit of that affordable housing development. So what you find here is a much more robust policy than was adopted in 2022. Um, it really does design, uh, des describe the application process, our evaluation process, um, clarifies things about the fees, clarifies how the special limited partnership comes together and what we expect in return. And we also put on here um, some ongoing management fees because there is some compliance that staff would have to do to make sure that they're upholding the commitments that are made for these partnerships. So. The red line that you see in your packet, this is really what just came in most recently. Um, there's two major ones. First of all, for those existing projects that I was talking about, we really wanted to make sure that we um, left this a little bit more open to negotiation because those are gonna be really special circumstances and we need to carefully weigh the benefits to the community from removing something from the tax roll that's already there um, and evaluate their their purpose for wanting the property tax exemption because the intent is not to allow just an extra profit on the property. It's really in, in exchange for a benefit. 
So there's one piece there is just talking about for those existing projects, making sure we have negotiation tools. And then the second one is under the partnership terms, uh, when we are considering the, um, the special limited partnership and what we expect in return, we expect a, an option for a first right of refusal, but our, the special counsel that we had helping us with this uh, told us, advised us not to get too prescribed there and to leave it open to negotiations because every property has a different setup and organization and we don't want to pigeonhole ourselves into something uh, that we can't change. So it was just, we still expect a right of first refusal to make sure that the housing is still um, part of our affordable stock if we have the opportunity to, to take it over or negotiate how that works with the, the payment for the fees, et cetera. Yeah, to give you a, a theoretical example on this one, we've never thought this was gonna happen, but let's say that there's, and we talked about this with the advisory board, so let's say there's a 200 unit multifamily complex with under their existing structure there are a tax credit project, some project, and they're providing a significant portion of affordable housing. But because they didn't go through this process, they don't have a tax exemption, which means they're currently paying property tax. And they come and say, well, because we're meeting these thresholds, we want the ability to just pay these property tax exemptions. We all have the ability, <clears throat> as a housing authority, to enter into a special limited partnership to give them a property tax waiver. So let's say, theoretically, we're paying $2 million in property tax. Um, the housing authority could engage into a negotiation with them and say, we want a first right of refusal when you're, you know, let's, uh, let's say it's a 15 year compliance period. We want first right of refusal when the 15 year compliance period comes up. Uh, we want a, not a preference, but we want you to contact us um, when there are openings for voucher holders potentially so that we can direct our voucher holders in there. And let's say we want a million dollars annually to be paid to the housing authority for um, the luxury of. And I'm just making skinny numbers uh, for the luxury of this property tax. Well, that would take potentially $2 million off the property tax roll and shift a million dollars into the general operating fund of the housing authority, which then allows you to A, deal with the financial issues that we have, B, leverage that million dollars against the affordable housing fund for the construction of other projects so that we can increase, so we can handle some of these affordable housing needs. And so it's a mechanism that's available to the housing authority where you can enter into these as special limited partners and Ben Doyle is the one that provided this information but not get so rigid that you don't have room to negotiate because um, every one of these has, will present its own unique circumstances that you have to meet. Um, thank you. Can you put other conditions on that benefit um, the city and the public? So, for example, could you um, make them put solar panels in the battery in their complex and allow city communication services to be provided? Um, I don't know if we could because we're doing this as the housing authority. I mean, we can look at it. Um, I think the key piece for them is they're going to be looking at the margins and going, does this make sense financially for us or not? Well, that's a question that we, you know, in, 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 in lieu of part of that million dollars that they were going to put in the housing fund. Um, because Maybe. there Maybe. are other value yeah. propositions that policy wise we have to deal with. Mr. Morris? Just so I'm clear, <clears throat> the, we would, the housing authority would have the option basically to take property uh, off, the, off the rolls um, forever, whatever, for this unit, for this 
combination of units. As long as it's affordable housing and they're gonna So um there's a, isn't there Tim, I guess maybe this is a question for you. In, in the in the statutes uh that uh, that, that um uh, establish the basis for creating special districts. There are for, there are some reasons, and I, it, may, it may vary based on statute 32 and 34. I, I'm not close enough to that. Where where there are some ex exemptions that can be allowed, right? If there's a district created, going to be a new property tax. Uh, property owner can go to the, I think the county commissioners to have their property taken off the rolls. And in other for for some reasons and for other reasons they cannot. Does, does that make sense to you or track you track that out? <coughs> yeah. So how would that how would that work in this case? I think I, I think that's an accurate statement that there are some not only I'm, the only reason I know this is we've been so deeply into this conversation with this old childhood issue, right? And um, looking at the statute. I don't know if it's statute 32, uh, CRS 32 or 34, but but it's, it, it lays out the, the reasons and stipulates for this one, you cannot get an exemption, others you can. Different statute, totally, totally different statute that we operate under, uh, and it's pretty basic. I don't know if you've called it up. It, yeah, I did. It, it's pretty basic. It, I, I believe it, I don't think it can be completely off the track. Makes you exempt from taxation as long as you get that under the control. And it's in proportion to the total value. Okay. So that's the special limited partnership because we become part of, and frankly, we, we did it on Christmas too. I don't know if we did it on Christmas one. Um, I'm not sure. That was pre us. We'll do it obviously on Zinnia. We'll do it on Zinnia. So any one you do, you have to do that because if otherwise your capital stack gets south. I mean, this is a new piece that sort of fell in our lap where we were like, oh. Can I ask one more question? Um, uh, th this would be a terrific opportunity for us and for for partners. Um, has there been any discussion with the school district or others who who will be affected by this? Um, not yet. No. Is it, uh, are we premature, or is that going to matter, or is it so insignificant in terms of their their total revenue stream? I think a uh, it'll depend on the project. So we don't every every project's going to have its own basis, for lack of a better word. And so I think what we would do is, as you see these come forward, you would do the evaluation and to understand what's lost and what's lost and to whom. Yeah. And then before we would bring something to you all to look at specifically, we would engage in those conversations. Uh, but I think it's hard to generalize this because they all have their own financial characteristics. And just to clarify, this is not new. This has been going on through the Housing yeah. Authority. This is just really cementing a policy. Um, and this is very common across all kinds of authorities in Colorado. Eugene asked the question if I could use him. He goes, well, do we even know about this? And the answer was, as a city who receives property tax, we had no clue who was getting this exemption when we were not part of the housing authority. Because the housing authorities can engage in those relationships, and then the special limited partnership just gets the tax rolls. And so we have properties here that agreements were made when they were constructed what was the uh, we have a whole list yeah we have a whole list of that we that the housing authority received fees for at, at one point in time not ongoing but one point in time fees the only, that fees the only different was the fees are now much higher and we're building ongoing and when something presents itself it's currently paying, it gives us some negotiating ability to, to look at these components. And then each project's going to present its own financial issues. And, and we'll give you an example when we talk about some development challenges we're running into on one of them now. And so, yeah. so, my, so, my question is um, Are you a little bit nervous about having a property tax exemption on? 
partnerships that are outside of the LHA umbrella. Um, it could, these would all be, I mean, we would, the LHA would be, a, in order to get it, you have to be a special LHA limited LHA. partner. So you would be in the ownership structure. And we built in what we could here regarding maintaining the health and safety of the property, um, ensuring there's no compliance issues, just making sure that if LHA is assigning their name and ownership to it, that it is withholding LHA values and serving their commitment. So would the development be uh, entering to our ICO of 12% or would the whole development have to be affordable? Uh, it can be, so this can be applied on a percentage basis. It is based on, in statute, the percent of your units that are affordable, that's the amount of property tax exemption you're and eligible for on a percentage basis. And okay. would it all be significantly over 12%? I mean, if they're only These building are, what you're required, that we're not, that's one of those we're talking about. Yeah, these are typically LIHTC projects. projects that are all under 60%. Um, whether they're deed restricted or not because of our IH, the city's IH policy that's different, but that would, we, this wouldn't expect this to apply to somebody who's building just their 12% IH on-site units. Okay, so the property tax uh, exemption would be only for the percentage of affordable housing. Okay, mm -hmm. that makes sense. Um, my other question was going to be, since this opens up to you, would we be giving other exemptions or tax incentive, uh, building incentives to the developer on top of the property tax exemption? As the city, that would be an option through mm -hmm. planning. Yes. No, that would be through our housing process where we would look okay. at that. That would depend so it's two different questions. So we do that now. Right. Um, so when we bring an affordable housing project, so there's the tax exemption before they're built, and then there's the tax exemption after they're built. So we've got to split these two apart. So when we bring a project to you all, and we're trying to manage the, the gap in the financing, because every one of these has its own gap. Okay. And we'll, to, to give you a, just a, a, a hint of what we're going to go over is so like the one on Hilbert, there's a four million dollar gap. So the way you cover the gap is you start looking at everything we have in our arsenal to shrink that four million dollar gap down. And so they would get both because you need it on the operational side on the ongoing dollars. That's for those that are planned to do both. Those that are built that are asking for it is a completely different equation, and that's one where you tend to look to pull more money out of it so that you can maximize, A, we can cover the $600,000 ongoing operating gap that we have and leveraging some dollars for other construction. And how long then would the tax exemption last on the LBJ? As portion. long as we are on, the LHA is on the ownership structure. So typically, let's say you go through, if it's a line tech project, you go through a 15 year compliance period. And then if um, you are resyndicating or the investor wants to exit, then if that ownership structure changes, then then that, then that your exemption goes. If we go, the exemption goes. Um, yeah, and, and it's built right now based on 15 years in terms of our fee calculator. Okay. And if you have a first right of refusal, associated with this and then they want to sell we may come in and go we want to buy and then then it's an perpetuity because we own it and it's, it's really how do you maximize the unit's community. Okay, uh, Commissioner Martin. Thank you. Um, just to clarify for myself because a lot of the examples that people have been talking about have been for new development but how about the first thing, sorry, Carol's um, uh, The first example you gave was for uh, a an existing property that had a lot of low-income residents, a lot of vouchers for mm -hmm. residents already, and so they could do this to re-syndicate or or syndicate. Maybe, no, not right? even resyndicate. Just let's say a project. I mean, they want they wanted to, they want to um, they want 
they want to fix themselves. They want to upgrade. They want to do something. They need to pull some operating money out. And but that's that. Even though we had a lot of examples about new development, that's that's still a big part of the example. So you know, it could be it could be Clover Basin Apartments, for example, and that would work. Yeah, so let's say you had a unit that was tax credit, that was funded via tax credits, that... What was it wasn't? I mean, what if it, what if it was private property that wanted to enter into one of these <coughs> because it's close to compliance or because it would be compliant if it were... That's apartment. where you need the flexibility to have that conversation, but I think where you will see this happen is a, pro is a project that has received tax credit funding. But for whatever reason, the policy that the housing authority had at the time, they weren't going to qualify on looking to Molly because they may have been, they may have provided 40% affordable housing and the policy was 50%. We changed the policy where we have some flexibility based on what's being built and they may go, oh, we want to take advantage of that. But that's where the negotiation starts. And other things we didn't talk about, as we said, you have to be in a crime-free multifamily housing program. You have to adhere to their requirements. So with Sarah now as part of the team, if you have somebody where you become a special limited partner and all of a sudden you're having issues with their property and they're not taking their recommendations, we can go, we're done. Right. It gives us some leverage points on some things that we don't have leverage on that really benefits the resident. So another answer to the question, how long does the arrangement last, is while they remain in compliance with the rules of the department. And as long as we're special with the department. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think that we need to uh, vote to approve the uh, partnership policy, tax exemption partnership policy. A little approval. Second. So, okay, approval of uh, the tax, the LHA tax exemption partnership policy was made by Commissioner Lawrence, seconded by Commissioner Pidoppo Ferro. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed? So that passes unanimously. Tim, you might as well stay up here with us. This is like a different So, have you all always had the um, the facilitation fee or the administration fee of the thousand dollars? I think it's pretty cool to make sure that they. I know that's not proper English, whatever. But I think it's pretty cool that you all are making sure that they align to our mission. Yes. Um, that's very very important. But, so what made you come up with the $1,000 facilitation fee, which is also means, but I just wanna know. We were researching other housing authority policies in the area, and most of them do have some sort of ongoing fee, just because it will take us some level of staff time, not a lot in most cases, but some level of staff time to make sure we're checking out all of their compliance pieces. Mm -hmm. So it's not, we're not trying to reinvent the wheel, we want, Provide us like your check of audits, and we will make sure everything looks good. We're not going to audit you and do a heavy lift, but just trying to keep tabs. Well, that's actually an interesting. So this all kind of exploded in the board of commissioners meeting in a good way. So people, they all volunteered, started asking questions, and then we were literally sitting there going, "Okay, we're trying to monetize." Uh, we're trying to get enough funds to, to create affordable housing. And I know we're putting a million dollars in annually in the general fund, but if there's a way for us to also bring funding in on this side, then it really maximizes the potential that we have to really further the broader goals of affordable housing in the community. And this is one of these classic examples where you're learning through if you're just on the housing authority side, you don't see this. And if you're just on the city side, you don't see this. And this is kind of where you see us start blending these concepts together to really further our, bro our broader affordable housing strategy. And that latter piece, you're not gonna see in other communities, but I don't know that they've ever had anyone approach about it. Probably because they already have this policy and most of them are in it. <laughs> This was definitely, everything that you see in these 
the, the changes that were made. We had two whole working sessions with the advisory board, um, bringing in Boulder County, uh, Lauren Selly with the Boulder County Housing Authority, just pouncing off ideas, running through fair housing checks and making sure that everything made sense. So this was actually, this has been in the works for quite a while. In the, in the side note to this, Eugene and I were in a different meeting. It has nothing to do with the housing authority, but it has to deal with housing generally. And they threw out some concepts that um, we're really intrigued by because um, San Antonio is probably on the cutting edge on some of those things. And so we're going to take that and start diving into it because we think it may create some additional opportunities for more affordable housing and potentially even attainable housing, especially on the rental side because attainable rentals on this non-existent here. And, and so we're going to be bringing some more concepts that as we learn, we're learning through on it as we're dealing with different conversations. Um, so this is a report that we do every year. It's due at the end of February. It's a um, CMAP stands for Section 8 Management Assessment Program. So um, we gather up a lot of information for HUD um, and fill this out, document um, how we came up with, with the answer and then this is sent in and we're given a score. Um, the last time we did this was in 2019 because of COVID, it was, we had a waiver. So this is the first year that we were doing it since then. Um, the, the score that we have would give us a high performer. You have to get a 90, 90 points or higher to get a high performer. So we've hit that mark this year. How many points? We got 115. Congratulations. Wow. Only 2% shy of getting 15 more. <laughs> <laughs> I know. We're not going to forget that. We're not going to forget that. We're going to be at 95% next year. And that was Lisa. So we never went into our reserves. We went into our reserves this year. So um, we, were, we were close to Lisa, what they considered Lisa. <laughs> we were at 93%. And what about the utility on my own seven? So there's a couple of things that I, I noticed here. That should be a yes. Um, and then the check mark under 14B is not applicable. And that was missing. Um, so that would be correct if you fix it. Is that what you want? Yeah, that's okay. Any questions in this meeting? Mr. Resolution. See none. I, I'm impressed. This is great. <laughs> Do you know the history of what the LHA has done for that before? So in 2019, you, the, the records that we found, they were high performers. Um, I don't know if they were audited by HUD. And that was adjusted, but um, they were, they, I think they benefited from it. So we uh, need uh, we need a motion to adopt a resolution in 2023 05 for the CMAP certification. I'll move resolution 2023 05. Okay, so this resolution 2023 05 to adopt the CMAP certification in 2025. Commission in the water, same thing by the Commission in the water. Oh, Yargo. I'm sorry. I know. We, we, there's so much time together, it's hard to sound alike, you know? <laughs> 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 um, any discussion? Seeing that, let's vote. All those in favor of the documents. Aye. 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 All those opposed. That passes unanimously. So I'll open this up and then I'm going to ask for Tim's help. 
So with our, our new um, extra special support from the CAO's office, um, we're doing a couple of cleanup items to make sure that we are on sound footing going forward. So there was a former motion back in 2020, I believe, maybe 2021, um, about approving signatory authority for the executive, executive director. Tim, do you want to give a, a comment on why we're adding this one in today? Yeah, we, this is a kind of a common uh, resolution that has been put in the past. In the past, um, Carol was given signatory authority for them to be kind of an executive board member. He's no longer the executive board member. Um, so this is clearly what that title is. Um, he has that authority otherwise in the bylaws, but this is um, more clear in terms of grant authority and it helps with the delegation of authority. Um, Yeah. Nothing's really changed other than authority. Yeah, the purchase anything that he's authorized for under like the purchasing policy, if he's authorized by, by this resolution, that it all matches up with the policies. If it's not, I mean, you all have given us authorization under certain dollar limits, and mm -hmm. so if it's within those, uh, if it's within that authorization, I just sign it. If it's exceeding the authorization, then we can bring that back to you. Okay. But to know what the contracts are for, I mean, here's what I'm concerned about, just to know how, how it's being run, etc. If you have contracts out there for services rather than for uh, development or construction, uh, do we see those or do we just allow you to? Or if it's within the dollar threshold. Okay, well, regardless of what it is. Right. Okay. What is the dollar threshold? Uh, we bring anything to you that's over a hundred thousand okay. dollars. Which these days. Most recently, you approved ahead of us signing our auditing contract at the end of the year. We brought that to you, um, and as we prepare, we've got architecture agreements and construction agreements that are coming. Those will come to you as well. Okay. So, seeing no more any other discussion, we now I have a motion to move the resolution 2306. I move the resolution 2306. Second. And so, we have to move by Commissioner Mark and Senator Mark and Commissioner Danielle McLaren. All those in favor. Aye. Aye. All those opposed. That passes unanimously. Congratulations, Carol. You get to sign everything out. <laughs> <laughs> Keep on signing. Keep on signing. Well, I'm lucky I don't have to do check day all the time. Molly can do that. <laughs> check day is not fun. I signed 50 checks the other night. I was signing, signing them. Yes, the Sometimes it's a short order. So we're now at resolution 202307. We're at the interim director. Let's see how it works. Oh, please. Do you want to talk about why we needed this, Tim? This is related to... Yeah, this is kind of your request. Um, you were recently uh, applying for a grant and it, it requested an explicit authorization. It requested a documentation of authorization to apply for the grant, which is fairly uncommon um, in my experience, but um, this would make it a little easier to just give a resolution to hear their authorization. Yes, yeah, so this was a weird one where I think it was like, a, it was a big grant, so pretty familiar. And most of these, when you're applying for it, don't require board authorization. And in this case, it did. And so we know we're building so many programs at the state right now, and we are not ever sure what the requirement is that we wanted to go ahead and have coverage. So you all give me the ability to sign off on grant applications um, because they will all be connected to projects you're aware of. But it was just a weird nuance of it. This is a slightly different issue. This is probably more similar to the issue we had on the <coughs> city side where we, uh, during flood recovery, when there was so much money coming out that we 
you all have to give me blanket authority to do that. This is more akin to that. This is a slightly different issue. And if we are successful and receive grant funds, then, then we have to bring it back. Yeah. So do we have any other discussion on this case? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'm sure. I'll move the approval of time to include the second. Second. Okay. Um, resolution 20 to include the second. This is the first time I'm going to take the record to see how the land is made by Commissioner Michael Perry, seconded by Commissioner Long. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? So that passes. So let me start this one. So if you all were, well, no, you all won't remember this. Those of you who weren't here, uh, when we originally started engaging in conversations with the housing authority uh, to enter into this relationship, we went through a period of time where we were trying to figure out do we move everybody over? Do we not move everyone over? And we were kind of heading down the road of moving everyone over until we got the PARA. And so PARA is the retirement system that the housing authority was part of. Um, and as we started going through untangling the PARA equation, what we realized is that it would have been very expensive for us to move everyone over to become city employees because you would have to buy out of the para contract because you still have you still have retirees on the para system so that was a piece there and, and then in terms of their retirement system and evaluating it you know it's a 20 year uh, under para it's 20 years you can retire and so we felt well because of the buyout cost we need to keep everyone we split it so those positions that are included in the contract, so the accounting um, the position that Sarah's in, the work that we're all city employees, the housing authority members, so the property managers, maintenance, Lisa, because Lisa was already in the PARA system, they're still housing authority employees under PARA. That's important because what comes out of it is they are not city of Longmont employees. We then said they will follow all of the city of Longmont policies. And so a couple of things started happening. When we um, redid our on-call policy, it didn't make sense for the housing authority, but the direction was they're under our policies. And I'll let them go over that in more detail. So that was a piece. Then under workers' compensation, because they we are um, have insurance on workers' compensation. We've got uh, we've talked about looking at SERSA and others, but it operates in, in a manner that is completely different than the city's working workers' compensation policy. Which, when we start doing things like leave share and how much we pay under the city's workers' comp policy, uh, the insurance provider for workers comp on the housing authority side we're like no we're not going to do that so we had to figure that piece out too um, and they cannot be part of the city's workers comp policy because they are not city employees which is built into that piece which would create issues with our excess insurance carrier in terms of how it works so as a result of that, well now, now that I gave you a bit of the history, Molly can talk about what we're having to do. Uh, so we'll be uh, working with HR going forward to figure out uh, what works best um, to modify to be able to make this all work together. So Lisa, do you want to give a little bit of background on the on-call, the conflict? So when we went to come over, you, the city paid anybody who got called back or an on-call two hours minimum. For us, some nights we can have three, four calls, so we'd be paying all that each time, and it was not in our budget, first of all. And then our nature of work is so different because most of our calls are 10 minutes or less. It's a lockout, a clogged toilet, something minor, flipping a breaker. So it did not align kind of budget-wise and time-wise to pay LHA employees under the city policy. 
<laughs> so, and we, A, wanted to let you know that there's a deviation, and the deviation, there's a very specific reason there's a deviation. Uh, we would like to build an on-call policy that we're probably going to have two categories within that on-call policy. Uh, one piece is going to be for calls like lockouts, minor things that take X amount of time, and I think, what did we say we used to do the other day? It's going to be a one-hour period. Instead of doing the two-hour period, we're going to do a one-hour period. Most of the time so on the city side, when we call people out, it, it's at least an hour and a half, two hours. So the nature of the calls are distinctly different. Um, and then we may have a second, what did you say? Did we put the second one in there? Um, for, let's see, it's to include travel time as well. And then if they get called back while they're already on a call or within 15 minutes, it kind of just adds to that call. And then. Yeah, I think that's, so it's a one hour minimum versus a two hour minimum. We may. I know we talked to Beth about this, I don't think she put it in there, but we may consider if you have a water leak or something more significant, it may be a two hour minimum, um, just because they don't know what they're going to get into, and, and so that's the basics there. And then on the workers' comp side, or on the workers' comp side, that's going to be... We're going to be reaching out to SERSA you know, and try and figure out if there's something that suitable for LHA and all of that, we're under the city and making this mesh. Um, can I add to the callback why we decided to increase it up to an hour? Is because it's a big disruption of life for these maintenance guys. I lived it for one weekend. I did on call. I answered six calls in a weekend, did lockouts, did dishwashers, toilets, you name it. Um, but like what really ones that kind of made me see it was in the middle of the night when I got a lockout call for the suites at three o'clock in the morning on a Monday morning. So I drove to the suites, unlocked the door, got home and it's like four o'clock in the morning. I'm like, I can't go back to bed. I got to get up in an hour, you know, you can't even like rest or anything. So I heard it was very disruptive. So kind of gave us a lot of insight because that happened like the week before this meeting. So, <laughs> so we had when, when the we first transitioned to the uh, city policies, we did bring that to you for consideration. So we will do the same on these two when we get the direction. We're going to need to go on these uh, for recommendation. We just wanted to be transparent. There is a difference. There are contractual limitations and other issues to deal with. We didn't want you to be surprised. I'd like to heads up. You're not sure, like, the full cost differential, or? Um, no, and we have to figure it out, but, uh, you know, when I, would, I have this conversation, we've got to figure it out. Yeah. I mean, there's the right thing to do, and there's using the monetary basis as a reason, and so we, we will figure that out. Sure, I just wanted to understand why we are voting on it tonight. Well, we were still learning through it. We still have week, enough yeah. information. Yeah. Yeah. Do you need the discussion, please? So you know that we can go to the interim and see people in case we can do it. So I want to jump in first. Um, I didn't see the development update. Uh, I think it's we. It's included in the interim. Yeah. So um, <coughs> I want to start on development updates. And so. We have been, as you know, looking at the property end up North Hover. And there's, so as you go through the development of these projects, um, we're on the front end of design, but we're already starting to build the pro formas. And what you start seeing early on, we've already made two design changes. Um, and they're driven by financials. So if you will remember the first time that we talked to you all about this, um, the three bedrooms were on the edges like this, and they were in more of a townhome concept. What we started realizing in the cost of that townhome concept was blowing the performer um, out of the water, and we couldn't really financially pull it together. 
So they gave us another option of stacked, what do they call them? Stacked flats. Stacked flats, which looks like ex on the exterior side, a townhome concept, and um, but still accomplishes the same objective on this. So you can scroll down. We'll get us accordance. Um, to the west of the lodge and high stuff. Yeah, no, just give me three coordinates where um, I don't So this is Cook. Oh, I don't know if you can see my cursor. Polar's here. over here. Yep. And that's seventeenth is down here. And that's eighteenth along building one. That's Walgreens. Yeah, this is Walgreens. All right. Mm -hmm. So where it starts getting even more interesting as we're looking at the financials on this, if you can go to because one of the things uh, we wanted to look at is the ability to bring um, other services into this location. And so you'll see the blue here and the pink here. And what we were talking about is one or the other would be library flex space, and then the other one would be flex space, or not flex space, library space, and the other would be early childhood space. Here's where the problems start coming in to this project. So this project is not in a qualified census tract, which is a big deal because if it were in a qualified census tract or a DEA, which is... It's like a, it's a, it's like a URA, like an urban renewal area. But not like the but, DEA in the right. downtown authority. You can actually include those spaces into the basis of the project. So in this case, you can't include those into the basis, which means that you have to bring your own funding into the project for those activities. So in this case, um, beyond what the deficit is on the project, there would have to be an additional three million-ish dollars to come in to build the early childhood space and to build the library space. You can't build it in within the financing of this project. So we started trying to figure out, well, how do you bridge this gap? And, and you have to deal with the fact that all of this has to be done by the time you come into the tax credit application, which is a significant barrier to to really try to wrap your hands around. And that was just, that, that date was when? So we'll, we'll get to that. So the earliest date is in August of this year. The other challenge that's starting to show itself is when you look at the project, and if you go back to that other slide, assuming that you don't have early childhood and the library in here, and you just built units out, um, and you had flex space for the residents, there's a $4 million gap in the financing on this. So if you add those other components in, considering that it's not in a qualified census guide, that $7 million gap that you have to figure out the four million dollar gap is really due to the fact that it's not in a qualified census tract as well because the value of that is actually three to four million dollars so if, if this were in a qualified census tract we have no issues financially so you know we're at the point of you know trying to figure out if we want a library annex space in there how do we come up with funds to do it understanding how tight the budgets are on the city side. If you want early childhood, there are some grants that are out there. Whether or not they award them in time is another question that we're looking at. Um, and then we've got to really just break down this, this $4 million deficit um, before we're really even into deep um, design. So, that's what we're working with. Um, the choices that we have are go ahead and move aggressively toward um, an August 2023 submittal into the LIFEC round, but that almost means that we have to pull 
the early childhood and the library piece is completely out of it because uh, we won't know where we sit financially. Uh, we won't close until June and we won't be ready. If it's flex space instead, or is it going to be units instead? It will be both. It will be units and flex space for the for the building. Okay, so the it would it be possible that later after the building is financed and built and leased and stuff, that the flex space could be turned into childcare or <laughs> That's what we were hoping for. That's what our idea was, and the way that you come in with the investors and everything that's in place, it's almost impossible to untangle that. Mm -hmm. And so the other option that we talked about is splitting the project in two, which February is the 9% deadline. And so because if you split it in two, then if you have a small enough project that could qualify for the 9% tax credits. Uh, the problem is there that is if you fill that gap, then you may not have enough to fill the other gap down the road. And then, you know, which one goes first? But for me, the biggest thing that concerns me is when you look at mobilization costs on a project this large, I would think that you're probably adding anywhere from a half a million to a million dollars in mobilization costs if you split it up in two. Um, the other option that just hit is we don't go for a 2023 tax credit submittal um, and we push it off until August of 2024. That gives us some time to try to pull these other components together. But it kind of, we're starting to really weigh issues in terms of what's more important. Do we want to try to get in because remember, it's also really possible a lot of times on your first submittal, you don't get awarded. So you need a second, which may mean we're going in next year anyway if we don't get awarded. But now we're trying to really figure out, and this is why I wanted to talk to you all about it, is if housing is going to be the key, do we drop some of these other components out of it and just go forward with this housing project, which is a three bedroom flat construction and then a traditional multifamily environment with one and two bedrooms in it at about what 80, 89. 89 units just know that you can't bring these other pieces along because of the way the financing you know limits your ability so a question um, I, I, because housing crisis, I think going ahead with, with the you know the, the plain no frills solution is probably preferable. But I'm wondering again, grasping at straws here, you know there's there's stuff around. Um, would there be an opportunity later to acquire another building and put um, childcare and library in it there? that's nearby, across the street, across the parking lot. Potentially. Um, it just some, makes making the sacrifice easier. Yeah, there's, there's some land that's associated with the broader development just to the southwest, um, behind a sort of you know, diagonal, you know, if they have that oil change location, <coughs> then you have the shop with Starbucks, there's a fairly large piece of land there. I don't know what the market or the cost would be. Um, but what you're, I mean, yeah, so there, there would be the opportunity to do something like that. So if I may add on just kind of backing up to what our original goal was here, because obviously this is a housing authority property, it's, it's intended for housing. What our original goal was is this, because there's so many, boxes checked already on this site. It has some real things that are typically challenges that won't necessarily be for this project, like public improvements and zoning and things like that that are already set in place. Um, so this was really, if, if the city and LHA, we're going to try and stretch our legs using ARPA funds for our you know, one-time opportunity um, and 
trying to really see what a city and LHA partnership organizationally could bring into a project to really serve residents, what would we do? We would stretch our legs and do everything we can to make uh, to pull out the best of both organizations and put it here and really make this um, the, you know, the library and the early childhood care center that would benefit these residents in a way that's not really out there and it'd be really something unique and quite amazing. Knowing we went in with several wish list aspirational goals, exploring prefab housing, we've already determined this, really not a financial feasibility, so we've already axed that one. Um, then we're talking about our library and early child care and trying to get larger units for families because we know that that is where our largest wait list, um, they just sit there for waiting and waiting. Um, so those were our, our huge goals, knowing that we probably weren't gonna get all of them. And so we we're definitely at that point where we have to decide, and at this point, we're at the juncture where we decide to go all housing and still try and get our larger units or basically take the time to try and do the, the combo. Um, so I think we don't yet know if we transition it to all housing, we don't know exactly how many units that would be yet, but that's something that would be coming next. We're gonna have them run that model for us so we can see the two side by side. But I just wanted to back into the history of what we were trying to do at this site, knowing we would have some reality checks. And we're basically there, just to give some context. Michelle, did you consider this transformation of housing? We, we tried to get into that. And I got four different ways. We four, about four different ways, and we're told, yeah, this doesn't do it. But to the department, do it. So, mm -hmm. It's not a, a well, now we have to move to your grant. That was really very informative. And you know all about it already. So it was Prop 103 and how you get into the, uh, you have to follow, you have to get into the membership by November 2022. That, that may be a different one. So there's one that's active now for transformational. Um, but we were basically, told that this doesn't fit and we're probably going to have all the mothers fit in the next two weeks. So if this was the Metro Mayor's uh, Coalition Caucusing with Doe was there, DOH was there, uh, 123, uh, a lot of information. Um, <coughs> would you, they're going to send you their slides and information or that information is going to be excellent. Yeah. If we don't apply, thank you. If, you, if we don't apply in August, you know, it's a nine percent, four percent. It's four percent. So that that this is a four percent project, or would we also consider nine percent? Um, if, if we do a nine percent, we'd have to break it into two projects. So it's, it's a four percent. Yeah. August is the target. Uh -huh. What's the next window or the next other thing? Next August. So it's just it's one. It's, it's annual. Okay. Yeah. Um, and this this is such a reach that you know it, 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 it may not matter. Uh, it may be something maybe just kind of irrelevant. But depending on what you decide or what we decide in terms of this application, you got to at least be mindful that this early childhood proposal and you know, and this council I think is going to get a presentation next Tuesday. Yeah, is it yeah. Yeah. And Matt Elder is going to do a presentation on what kind of where the alliance is with its work. Um, and just so you know, you'll hear this next Tuesday, I'll just, just give you a preview. Uh, we've had meetings with count, uh, county commissioners both in Weld County and Boulder County. Not all the commissioners in Boulder County, two of them, We met with all the commissioners in Weld. With a surprisingly receptive audience. It was a very, far more productive conversation than one other anticipated in. And very receptive in Boulder, although it was just two of the three. Um, but the proposal is to put on the ballot, a, a, a ballot, a, a, on the ballot this year, a question about creating a, a special early childhood district. One question. The second question would be a mill levy that goes with that. That's the reason I, you know, we've been talking about mill levies and what's you know, included or what can be exempted. Um, and I will tell you that, that, the, that the number we're talking about in terms of mill levy, probably the, the, the smallest number is four mills. Now, I don't think you get that or not. 
The four mills generates forty-five plus million dollars in footprint annually for early childhood. Uh, and among the things that that are laid out in a service plan is the potential to support capital projects. Not that the special district would be taking them on, but they would be funding capital projects of others. So depending on what we do here, if that were to succeed, uh, we should be paying attention to this, that as an opportunity to fund projects like this in partnership. Just, you know, it may not happen, but I'd, I'd hate to, if we don't go in August, I'd hate to miss the opportunity to take advantage of that. Now here's the interesting piece. They could probably, under basis, get early childhood in here but it can only serve the residents of the facility, which I think operationally is, I wouldn't do that because yeah. you may end up with 20 spots that you can't fill and you can't get what you mean. Just saying there may be a way to get yeah. you know, now, what that, you need for a job here. If we wait a year, then opportunities like that, you know, the other opportunity is, well, do we want to add the one and a half million into the library number and the library cultural recreation tax, you know, but if you do all of those things, then you're, then you're going to get housing out of here. And that's really the question is, do we, do we want to continue trying to hit this August or do we want to push to 2024? And I think that's where we'd like some feedback. I'm just saying, putting it back in your mind, if you decide to wait, if there's some other things that might materialize. The other thing is, I mean, this is the classic example of, you know, you've heard me say this before, this is market rate and interest rate eating everything alive right now. So are you hoping that interest rates might be down in the year? You know, I was kind of hoping that until we um, got our report so those numbers that are part of uh, the city retirement boards, we've all gotten, uh, we're going through our quarterly meetings and that. And so here's what's happening in the market. Uh, you know, what they're telling us is, I think everybody was projecting it a trend down, mm -hmm. but inflation's not moving as fast as they would want. And, you know, what they said in the, the meeting I was in is that we may be really in that resetting of interest rates in what is truly normal, which is a six to 10% range, which doesn't help. And the other scary thing is um, when you were looking at inflation, it was starting to trend down and kind of spike in the last, and the last job number um, came out and showed that there were not enough people for the jobs that were created. And in that meeting, they said for every 1.8 jobs open, there's only one person to apply for it, which means you're 0 0.2 down, which also then tends to tell us that we're going to continue seeing this. And I just showed Eugene this earlier, Home Depot just announced that they're going to add $1 billion to one. B, capital B, to their wage structure uh, for the coming year, which just is everything's telling you we're going to continue to be in this fight, which means construction prices and commodity prices are going to continue moving. So I, I think we, I don't me think we're going to see it. Me that says we're going to still have people who can't find a place to live, and so we should hurry. Even if it's not as cool as we thought. And we may hurry and still get the August and go, oh crap, we can't fill a gap. But I mean, do you all want us to stay on track for August knowing that we can come back and tell you if the, the performance continues to get better? And, and that's what that depends on. We stay on track right now. But do you want us to continue moving to August of this year? There's no way that we're going to have to sacrifice some things. Go to uh, the other commissioners. I would say yes. Keep, keep trying to move here. Um, but there's no other options. Like, there's no other way that 
possibility that money would just come out the sky and <laughs> manna, well, you know what I'm saying? I just, I mean. So we are putting in for our childhood fund <coughs> that Christina found. So obviously, we think that's an April deadline and they're gonna award pretty fast. So if we were to get that, we would come back and go, okay, we're gonna put this back in. Um, the struggle is not getting too far along in design, but then we have to scrap and rebuild back as well. Okay. So that's some of our timing challenges that we have to think about now. When we design these um, housing units <coughs> or developments, I'm wondering if we should go backwards, look at the grants that are available, and then build it toward the grants almost. Like, what would a uh, transformational unit look like or development? And is there enough money to actually do that through those grants? Um, I don't know if that might sound silly in one sense, but money's out there. What, what do we need to do to get it? <coughs> Um, and the hard part is you're chasing so many targets so you're you're chasing the tax credits because the tax credits are really the bulk wouldn't you say molly mm -hmm. and so you may go after transformational and get sideways on the tax credit side is that a fair statement uh yeah so the the main feedback we got from the transformational group was that that they're really looking for those projects that aren't really light tech fundable. And so we are, and they won't, they don't wanna, because of the competitiveness of it and how much they've received, they don't wanna consider applications that are, don't already have a tax credit award. Okay, well, that's, that makes sense. And this is my soapbox. That's, I think, the challenge we face in this, mm -hmm. is that in order to really get affordable housing, you need tax credits in order to do it. But then they go, well, we want transformational, but not necessarily those that receive tax credits. And so now all of a sudden, you know, we started at transformational in that childcare library. But then all of a sudden, the way they design these programs, it's like, well, we don't fit, or we don't, and then it makes no sense in terms of how they're structuring some of these programs. and it, I don't know about Molly, it drives me crazy because you're like, if you're not it's getting chicken and an egg. It's a chicken and egg situation. Because the tax credits want you to have as much, for specifically, if we were going to do ECE and, and library, you have to go in with the funding in hand. But then for transformational, you don't want that. And same story with the QCTs, that's frustrating too. But it's, it would be so simple if you said, here's what we want to do and we're going to design it. So we want to go into tax credit, and if we don't get it, we're just going to convert it to units. Mm -hmm. They don't let you sort of build those real-time adjustments that, frankly, on the market rate side, you could do. Just so pursuing and going forward, um, can we have every commissioner to say what we want? What direction are we going to give to uh, board? Sure, I believe we should move forward, but also with the intention that um, I know I'm a dreamer, but believing that somehow we can get the funding for the child care. And I mean, we still don't know what's going to happen with universal, the universal child care. We have to get extra funding for that. Um, so that's a great possibility, too. Um, so I say move forward for the August of this year with intentions and I understand that we will have to dismantle and you know if we can't get the money but I have faith I believe in you all I believe it that we're gonna have the library and the child care center I just believe it so anyway I say move forward I wish I had as much faith as she did. <laughs> uh, there's a point, I guess, uh, there's a point where, where continuing to spend time and effort that you're going to look at, potentially look retrospectively, you know, that was a, we just wasted six months, and we could have been pursuing other possibilities. 
there's a there's a threshold there where if it's not if we get if maybe they were there now right we may be there right now even as you anticipate August I, I would hate to there's just not enough time or enough people to go around on this and it's primarily on YouTube because uh, you're gonna the opportunity costs are gonna be pretty substantial we we're, we're pretty close so um, I would say if, if, if we're I would say go go for it. I wouldn't as much as it would break my heart to not see the library and, and uh, child care facilities, however big or small, as part of this project. <coughs> to limit it to residents would be a would be a would be a non-starter. You have to have it more yeah. accessible. Um, uh, and I think Marsh is right. The cost of housing is such that um, it, it, the longer we wait, the more it's going to. You know. yeah. So I'd say go for it. Until you get to the point where it's like this is a waste of time, right? And then I, I wouldn't want you to waste time, as we said, go for it when you know it's a dead end. Yeah, no, we. I mean, we think there's a path forward on just. I mean, I don't know. What it is. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's a path forward on the housing. It just may end up looking slightly different. Um, but yeah, there's there there will be a point where. We just go, the gap's too big, we can't do it, and we have to figure something else out. The gap is the gap's big regardless, so even filling that by August, we have to really. Mm -hmm. Which is why the previous conversation where you gave us the ability to do some things, mm -hmm. if we can do those things, then that may be the partial gap filler. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, once you, yeah, I, I, I just, in my former life, the, the rule was always don't elaborate too many features too early. You know, solve the simple problem, get the, the uh, minimum viable product. Minimum viable product as soon as possible reduces human suffering in long run the most. So that's where I am. We can look at adding features some of time down the road, across the street, whatever. When would you know that you know, how deep into the project would you say it you know, like it's viable? Like, you know, how the library and the child care? Or just, yes, yeah. Uh, it depends on the grant. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I mean, May. And that's in April, May. Okay. Oh, I can tell so, you. but you would come back to us. You wouldn't wait. You know, you would be trying to make this happen no. and then come back in August. Like you would come back to us early on and say this is going to go like this. If you all say go for it today mm -hmm. on the housing, and if you have to give them the, the child care and the other stuff, then we would make those decisions real time. Mm -hmm. We would come back to you. If we can't bridge a four million dollar gap. Mm -hmm. okay. The development partners, they would like us to choose a direction at this point. Just for their spinning wheels too, you know. The more design we do. Yeah. So no, I, I mean I'd say move forward if there is a dire need for housing. And I don't want to go back. So I, I agree move forward on the housing is not the only thing. I'm going to say, wait, wait, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and this is a no, real this time. Is on wheels. We can move you right out of here. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, appreciate, I appreciate your direction. Um, this is real time. I mean, this started, what, Wednesday of last week? Is when it first, and you know, we had a call this morning, which is like, we've got to ask you the question today. Cool. So thank you for not kicking it down the road. Is what yeah. You're being. Yeah. yeah, we, we can. So I thank you. And then I think other development. Zinnia is moving along. Yeah, they're on track for closing in May. Uh, we're, there's a lot of moving pieces getting there. Get the one thing I do want to tell you about that that I think is getting lost in the conversation is Zinnia's permanent support in housing. And the mayor actually made me think about this the other day. And I think we don't do um, 
we don't talk about it enough that you know permanent supported housing is an option for the unhoused in our community because it is you know the percentage of people in the suites that we move from being unhoused into probably 80 percent right now wow. so so when we talk about housing solutions for those that are unhoused those 55 units are really a tangible connection <coughs> into our community and um, chair the mayor asked me a question and I went oh we haven't <coughs> talked about it this way so we're going to do more about openly talking about that yeah in addition to just talking about the permanent supportive and I talked about it I don't know if I wasn't supposed to or not but I have um, and it's popular um, but um, there's things about the design right it's it's what trauma-informed design. Trauma design thank you for the term we should talk about that because the suites doesn't have a good reputation because it's not trauma-informed right. and so it would be it, it, it'd, it'd be great for everybody to know we're thinking about that. Can I jump in? Because we actually just signed an MOU with University of Denver to do some research on trauma informed design at the suites. Oh, oh, so cool. And that's happened since I think we've been. Uh, <laughs> you can make a job. remodeling <laughs> changes or something. And it's little things that we're going to partner with them. They're going to come in and study residents, management, um, the layouts, and the spaces, and be able to help us do stuff and then they're going to be able to take their research into broader projects. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Get grant money out of it. Mm -hmm. We are. <laughs> so we're, up, we're on update on operations. <coughs> Who gets to do that? Oh, yeah. We all get a little piece of the pie. Yeah, so let's go to the age receivables first. Oh, mine's not the pie. Okay. Um, so, you're going to see an increase from the last quarter report to this quarter report because of the meth units and the, and the um, biohazard unit. We do add those costs to build, to rebuild those units to the tenant, and those will go into collections. Um, so that's asking those neighborhood, Fall River, and the suites. The suites have two big units um, with meth that were almost close to $100,000. So, um, there's no hope of collecting any of that in further. Probably not, but if we don't get it on the ledger and show that, you know, what we were finding is that wasn't happening, and then these people were coming back to us, we were housing them again and, and running into issues. So we need to make sure we document it. Um, so those were going, um, you know, we had 46 past due tenants, so it's $470,000. Um, in total, that is actually for past due tenants for our properties. Um, so that's where we stand on the age receivables. Um, the financials um, are all submitted to the auditors for all of our property audits. Um, I kind of highlighted, you know, where we went over almost every single property we were over on vacancies um, based on what we budgeted and where we ended. Um, the only one that was still in line was the first one, <laughs> but all other properties we were going over. Vacancies, um, and when we when we don't have the money coming in for those vacancies, we're also losing mortgage fees from those properties as well. Um, and so the change condition on that, if you remember when we went over the budget this time, Kendra went in and did all the analysis. That was to to ensure this would happen to the best of our ability. But yeah, and I think we're going to start also tracking those units closer. Um, to, to see where they're at and what what's actually happening, you know, is it appliances? Is it the wait list? Is it you know where where are our struggles with these units not getting um, occupied? Yeah. So we're going to start tracking that more too, and I can bring that on a quarterly. You want you can probably bring that on a quarterly basis. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so there were a couple properties that had utilities that were over. Um, a lot of that was probably related to the gas prices going up, and we're, we're going to notice that this next year too because I don't think we got the increase before we did the budget. Um, and we're going to really large increases in January. 
So um, that's definitely going to start increasing maintenance expenses. If they're, those are over, that would be even related to the snow removal. We had 20 plus snow events, which um, we're kind of reevaluating and maybe possibly getting our own trucks um, in house um, that we might be able to actually build back to the properties and have a better performer on the property level and also bring them back in to has a better And with what I suppose the gas bill and some of the other things, and, and January is not off to a good start either. I think we, and so I did talk to Jim. And so you know how this works, so I'm not on both sides of the equation. Uh, we, we met with Cash and Jim. Still, there's ways for us to get at least one, if not two trucks. And one of the little, I call them snow carts, that they can drive around and get. Uh, and with the trucks and the other piece, they'll let it work a deal where we can pay that back over time so we don't have to fully front the capital this year. Um, and we think that hopefully we can get that done relatively fast so that we can start relieving some of the pressure on the on what they're charging us for snow removal. But we've got to get that ongoing payback accomplished so that it doesn't create another financial issue. Yeah, we spent over $200,000 in snow removal properties. Can you not borrow one of the public safety electric trucks? Yeah, I'll be fine. Actually, actually, there's like an F-250 that's about to come off in another one that instead of auctioning, one of them instead of auctioning we're going to try to transfer, another one we're going to try to buy out early as we're transitioning this one of those trucks in so that we can start doing it ourselves. So what you weren't far off in terms of what we're doing. Just to clarify, so we, the, we've got 46 residents that on average are $10,200 in arrears. Yes. And I, I'm sure that varies. Are we have a, do we have a workout plan with each of those? So that is, so what's happening with that is the property managers start. So when, when they're, they're evicted, a lot of them is usually due to evictions. So it could be um, lawyer costs or court costs um, that get transferred. Um, so they try to reach out and a lot of the times they're, they're getting the mail back. And so they do that for 90 days and then we'll start sending it to collections. We'll, we'll edit, analyze it after they've done those, those 90 day letters and say, is it worth going to collections? Where do we think this person is? If not, we'll write it off. Otherwise, we're going to try to send it to collections. And is, is, there, is there a point? What does that trigger? I mean, by the, by the time somebody gets this far behind? Well, I think I think you would have to probably speak to that. Like, at what point does is notice happening to these tenants? You know what I'm saying? So if it isn't, if they are in arrears on rent. If it's rent, they're getting notices by the 10th of the month that, I mean, hey, you haven't paid rent. And then that's turning over, you know, to court. Sometimes we have to serve a second 10 day the following month because courts are closed. The attorney couldn't get to us because we had higher priority cases. So they're getting notice for, if it's for rent, two days after rent's late. Um, if it's meth units, stuff like that, that we don't have the accumulated cost to after move out, they start getting their 30 day notice, the 60 day notice, the 90 day notice, and we're trying to track them down. But most of the time, those contacts are no longer good. Yeah, so that uh, it's catching their money before they move out mm -hmm. that's useful. And it's, we have been able to sign some payment arrangements in court. So I did get one payment arrangement on the court docket. Um, they were behind um, rent of about $10,000 during the whole COVID thing. And so the judge made them sign a payment plan in the courtroom. And part of this is when you look at some of these folks remember COVID, they didn't have to, you couldn't go on evictions and non payment and things like that. So I'm sure that's some of those. I'm not hearing of any that they're allowing to accrue significant yeah. balances and I think a big part is that. Well that and the, the extra money is running out. So the money that they might have been getting from other agencies during the COVID time period, 
is revenue. So those prepayments that they may have received from thousands of dollars to take care of a few months of rent, those prepayments are starting to run out. They well. were having fun with the money instead of paying. I don't want to say that, but we got a lot of people who got the ERAP money who got back rent also got anywhere from three to six months of future rent. So if they were working and yeah, and then that money's ran out, so. But then also let's not forget about HUD due diligence. You know, it's a, a long process that you have to go through in the court system to make sure that, that the housing authority did their part mm -hmm. in providing uh, due diligence for the tenants. And so that takes a long time and they're not paying during that time. Those notices and like you said, trying to catch up with them too. It's, um, so the four hundred and fifty thousand, how much of it is that? Um, I don't have that problem at the top of my head, but a, a good chunk of it. I mean, you probably got mo the majority of the suites about two hundred and seventy good two hundred and seventy thousand is probably the, between core costs and, and mess and, and the biohazard unit as well. About six thousand for that one. The biohazard, yeah. So I mean a lot of that money is those so most of the ones that are probably over in, in rent or they maybe they left and, and the unit was a mess, it's probably in the $25,000 to $3,000. Plus, plus if you say three months rent, you know, by the time you get them to court and get, the, <laughs> and get them out, which takes um, a considerable number, you know, number of months of process. The sheriff right now, even after we get the eviction granted, I tried to schedule two evictions today and they're not till the end of March. Mm -hmm. so, we gotta just hold on to them for another 40 days. Yeah. Any garnish or income? Not when on social security and stuff like that. We are turning, on the HCD side, we are turning three or four over to law enforcement. For fraud, yes. For fraud. And then if they all under the um, the housing <coughs> vouchers, if it's project based or, or a voucher, um, we report it to EIE. And so if they try to get assistance someplace else, that comes up. And and it stops. They can't they can't get assistance someplace else. So, yeah. so the last is the voucher count. Um, so currently as of February first, we were at four hundred and ten um, vouchers. We had an additional 21 that, um, actually 25, that were on in stages of either getting um, their briefings done, uh, getting their vouchers issued, and now looking for housing. So we have 435 total vouchers, and all those were to lease up. Um, we also have court in vouchers of 11. We have decided to absorb those vouchers. <coughs> Um, into our program, mainly because we were hoping to always get to 420 and we were never able to reach 420 and we have more money coming in. So there was a, a, an act that was providing more money to the housing authorities um, due to inflation and everything like that. We're looking probably at a 7.5% increase. Um, so HUD is asking us to start looking at our two year tool now and see where we need to go you know, so we're going to take a look at that and see if we can add more. But we wanted to make sure those port ins are are given. And unfortunately, we've exhausted wait lists and we just never could reach that 400. Now, getting them all leased up at one time, they have 60 days. Um, and then we can give another 30 days and then another 30 days. So you're talking, you know, four months before they, they get leased up. So by the time you get people moving off, trying to get them leased up. Um, so I think that if we, we have absorbed the 11, so that brings us up to 421, yeah. um, and we still have 21 to do it. So I think uh, we're on a good track of just keeping a lot of people out there looking right now. Um, so there's something on this <coughs> I'm going to relate to a previous conversation in terms of what we've talked about on the tax exemption and, and giving us the first call for our voucher holders. The preference is kind of hard, but 
what are the dynamics that's in play as we've talked about how it's hard for people to, our voucher holders, to find locations to um, get housing? Even with the voucher. So, yeah, it's hard. The interesting thing that we started actually actively talking about, and I'm going to try to get some more information on this. One of the things that we know is that there's an agreement that the Longmont Housing Authority had with Boulder Housing Partners and the Boulder County Housing Authority that if their voucher holders come into Longmont, um, we don't have the automatic hoarding piece. And so they still manage the vouchers, which um, I think we're seeing a press because Longmont's the most affordable community in Boulder County. And if a number of their voucher holders are getting them in other locations and then coming and getting units here, that's pressing our voucher holders. And then they're not pouring over, which is money coming along with the pour over. And I think I get the agreement and I understand it, but the job you all want me to do is look after the financial interest of this organization. And I think we're going to have to dig into this conversation a little bit and probably engage in a real conversation with those other groups just because. I think there's a local impact, and they probably don't necessarily agree with this, but I'm trying to figure out how we really get the financial solvency of this organization to a different level. Um, don't know what that means, just know that I'm going to start working on it and trying to figure it out and understand what the loss is and how we can try to figure out how we can get some more revenue from the end, but it may turn into an interesting conversation. And that would be with Boulder, with Boulder County and with other Boulder Housing Partners. Yeah. And the same applies to us. Yeah, because yeah. we have some that go to Boulder. Lafayette, yeah. yeah. Jamestown. So we've got, we've got a lot of people that are outside of the city. So I'm going to want to see how many go outside, how many come in, and, and start really doing a data analysis on it to go. Are we in the positive or are we in the negative? And if we're in the negative, then maybe there's a conversation. If we're in the positive, we may go, oh, okay, this is yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I want you to know what we're going to start working on because we don't know what it's going to look like, but we need to look at it. I mean, Boulder County and Boulder Housing Authority and Longmont are they also um, formed the Landlord Assurance Fund. So we're hoping that with this Landlord Assurance Fund, if voucher person moves out and there's there's damages mm -hmm. that they have up to five thousand dollars that they can put in a claim to cover some of those damages that insurance doesn't cover um, and there's there's requirements under that but we're trying to make this more um, appealable to more more landlords so that's one of the ways that, that we're trying to do that so is that that's that's me in a nutshell. Okay, in a nutshell. So um, we had the occupants report, voucher report, um, property updates. Um, so for the occupancy and the property updates, make it brief. Um, we're holding at ninety three percent occupied. We do have a whole bunch of not a whole bunch, but a lot of movement scheduled for um, later in the month in February, pending weather. Uh, we we found that. Trying to lease units this time of year is very hard, especially with seniors. Nobody wants to move. They're saying, oh, in the spring, in the spring when it's warmer, I don't want to move right now. So it's adding to the vacancy, but we um, with, we have Fall River, Aspen Senior, and Village Place waitlist open. And so we're getting a lot of um, agencies who are helping people apply. And so that's getting them on the waitlist and they want to move immediately. So we've got people from Hope and the Senior Center who are really helping push um, people to apply who are looking for immediate housing. So that's our, um, we have two coming into Fall River this month. We've had quite a few at the suites. So that will help out for next month's numbers. Um, the down units, just a quick update on that. The suites, we still have quite a few down. Um, 7312, which was um, one of our meth units, it was involved in the flood last week. So that one um, and the two units below it are now part of a flood claim. One was just 
7114 was vacant for 270 days. The guy moved in on the same night. Um, so we're working through that. Um, Aspen Senior, they've had a meth da unit down for 290 days. Um, it's scheduled to be completed at the end of this month. And um, Aspen Neighborhood, we have um, a meth unit there. Um, we're trying to work out a plan to figure out how to get that one back online because insurance will not cover that one as we already exceeded our claim limits for that year. Uh, for property updates, um, activities that are started up again, these residents are having a blast. Let me just say they have four properties, have Irish dancers coming in for March. I just got requests for um, the birthday parties are all back in swing at all the properties. Coffee conversations are starting back up this month with the residents. And we've been able to fill most of our vacancies for staff. So the suites, we hired one building attendant that's doing the weeknights. We have two more starting next week that will cover the weekends. And that's taking the place of security. So we will have almost around the clock somebody at the suites, walking the halls, cleaning the property, helping with maintenance. Um, it's, it's been huge there. Um, Spring Creek Fall River, we had a management vacancy. Um, Gregory started last week. Residents are loving him. So off to a great start this year. Good. I see the cost of insurance for the city pilots is that issues. It went up. <laughs> <laughs> it went up generally yeah, so, though too, not just yeah. Like yeah, so there were there were several um, factors in the insurance. One is that we were finding that they weren't insuring they weren't increasing the insurance rates every year. So if we did have a total loss, we wouldn't be able to rebuild. Um, so we are gradually getting some of those properties up to that level. And when you do that, your insurance is going to increase, um, along with the percent of loss ratio. So depending on how much is in that bucket, if they diminish that, which is like what happened with the lodge and Hearthstone when they had that fire, um, they're almost like $10,000, $12,000 more insurance price because we wiped out um, the the that he had been paying <laughs> um, that got wiped out for that loss. And I imagine next year, with all the meth units and the ball houses, the suite, I mean, the suites is actually already at $100,000 for that year. Um, and that's because there's there's two things happening there. One is is all the stuff that's going on at the suites, but they also require our deductible to be at $25,000 for wind and hail. Um, which you have to do a buyback policy for that, and that's twenty five thousand dollars a year, just to do that. So with the meth detectors, would that um, add to you know, like when you get uh, certain things in your house for insurance, the insurance either goes down or would the meth detectors help at all with the insurance? Well, I think it's going to be a, a you know, as we talked, it's kind of going to be like as you start to add them or as you start to do the testing, you know, what you know, as we haven't done the testing on some of these units that we don't know what it's going to test at. Um, we do have a, a clause in our insurance policy that is there's a hundred thousand dollar gap per year for um, loss due to smoke or meth or product, I guess it's any type of product. So, so we've, we've hit that. So the unit where we have the two significant claims, we, we're out of insurance. So when Lisa said we're trying to figure out how we do it, we, we haven't abated. Literally, we were talking about, well, I know we have master electricians here. We have folks here almost taking the VCP model to have a city build day to where we can help facilitate this. And I said, well, I can take drywall and I can do flooring. Literally on some of these, because if you were to just contract that out, you, you really could. You could. <laughs> <laughs> it's a habitat model. It's a habitat model for some of this. Yeah. And so you get two significant claims on a property and you're, you're toast. And I imagine we'll be there for the suites too. This was the best one that was named. And they don't have much of the reserve, um, so we're gonna we're gonna hit the suites here soon. So, so we think that it's, it's too early to tell the insurance company to start adjusting to the you know the meth detectors are not even in the U.S. yet. Too. Um, and so it's we've had a conversations with them trying to say 
it's a preventative measure. It, even if there's a spike, it was, should go down over time, but it's an underwriting thing. They're just not used, they haven't faced this yet. Yeah, so we're yeah, trying to. Okay. All right. So is there anything else? Sarah, from this so this is Sarah's first health public health and safety update. Yes, oh. so I was, blessed with two big projects, cameras on all the properties, finding, um, we already have three bids for cameras, but we need to determine where we want them and externally, internally, all of that good stuff. So um, moving, that's moving pretty fast. And it, it looks like due to some of the things that we've seen with the NOLA cameras, that that's probably gonna be our best bet. Um, the other the other bids aren't off the table, but um, just looking at, at the quality and what we'll get with the NOVA cameras, um, I, I think you will see the, the, the big difference in the quality. So um, I should have that wrapped up by the end of next week as far as locations and needs, and I'll bring that back to this group and we'll move forward. Um, meth detectors. We are in the middle of that too. We are basically trying to determine if um, their system is compliant with ours. So without getting into the weeds of a lot of things that I'm learning, um, we have to make sure it's uh, E911 compliant, these SIM cards. Um, we have this company out of New Zealand is sending us their device. So we are going to test the SIM card uh, when we get it. And thank goodness for Valerie Scott's group and Valerie Dodd's group for holding your hand a little bit. Um, so that is moving pretty quick too. We've been at this point having weekly meetings with uh, the representative from the New Zealand. Um, they do have these devices in a, in a housing uh, development endeavor somewhere. We're trying to to, we're trying to get that information um, because they have some policies and things that we'd like to see that they've already, you know, why we end up, you know, if we could review some things and, and talk to them about what's worked, what hasn't worked, um, etc. So that's moving forward pretty fast. Um, so real quick, you know, she's a SIM card. An issue is it doesn't work with the LTE network we're building. But they've agreed to put it into development for next year so that going forward, they will have an option for the privately owned LTE networks. And it won't be an issue, but it's an ongoing cost issue if they don't do it. And so that's what Sarah's been dealing with. And that cost would be a lot. Like, I don't even want to throw the numbers out there. So um, it is a work in progress for sure. Um, I I talked to Lisa and to Carolyn and Molly about setting up a time for basically for me to attend all the coffee conversations and not just I would be the guest speaker all the time, but just when questions come up for residents um, regarding public health, safety, any any issues like that, I would I would be there. Um, we're going to start with the suites. In March, doing that. Um, on my plate is also reviewing Zinnia and Chrisman, too, as far as SEC Fed recommendations, and I, I do that with planning and development currently for no multifamily builds. So we, we provide the recommendations, and the, you know, it's not it's not anything we have teeth in. So they either they either take our recommendations or they don't. We've seen it, I've seen much success in the last maybe five to six years with our, our um, multifamily builds with them taking our recommendations. So um, that, that's a very good thing. And last but not least, um, our calls for service remain relatively low for all LHA properties. Um, I plan on talking to the staff here about how we want to bring that information forward to you as far as maybe a quarterly update on, on call for service a little bit more detail. Um, so working on that too. Any discussion for Sarah? Just didn't recommend Sarah, we got 
with your badge. <laughs> 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 you look like a I civilian like tonight. <laughs> Well, and I will say, <clears throat> bringing Sarah on doing this lets us shift and move people. And we had a tenant issue that um, was wearing Lisa out. Let us bring Sarah into the tenant issue. Commissioner Waters had experience with this tenant from his on the board, but it just shifts the nature of the conversation and how you can do it. And so. It's given us capacity to deal with issues at a different level and frankly give people some breaks because um, that is something I'm starting to really watch just generally about staff is when we have this conversation about kind of separate meaning there are <clears throat> and you'll hear me talk about this in the retreat but we're seeing uniformly uh, the people um, mental health, not people are concerned about their mental health they're concerned about their work life balance and, and what they're having to deal with. And so we're gonna start really taking a more active role with the entire LHA staff in terms of working on the, you know, bringing people in that can tell people how do you, you know, how do you build your own mental health? How do you deal with issues? Who do you talk to? How do you utilize peer support? Because if you saw the issues they deal with on a daily basis, um, it's significant, and and I would honestly say some of the issues they've dealt with is not that different than probably what Sarah's seen in the capacity of a law enforcement officer, which you're almost expecting that from their job. So there's another operational component that we're starting to really we talk about getting into. Um, they did great work. Great team. We need an in-house therapist. <laughs> <laughs> Don't we all? <laughs> I, I do have to, to support what Harold is saying. I mean, you wouldn't think that people running uh, properties, rental properties, would have so much access to uh, traumatic incidents and things that can give you PTSD. And it is, it's intense. Yeah, we so. believe that. <laughs> well, and that's part of it. So Sarah that's knows stuff. now there are certain things that it's probably primarily the two of us dealing with with Lisa. You know, I've, I've had to have conversations with each one of them. Are you prepared to see this? And are you okay with seeing this? Because if they're not, then that's where we have to start sliding in and support each other. And imagine what this is. We've learned a lot. <laughs> so they're great, they're fabulous, they do an awesome job, and I think you're starting to see where we're starting to get, we're starting to run. Um, and uh, sometimes I need to keep them from sprinting because I don't need everybody to worn out. Yeah. Uh, they're good, great. Felt good for quite a while. So we're at Commissioner Cummings. We have Commissioner Commissioner Martin. I have a Commissioner question. Um, we've got this other project out by Costco that for technical reasons I have special interests in. When is that going to come to us for a project report? Uh, we're still waiting on the planning and engineering design to come back to us. Uh, it came back and sent it back on a couple of questions. Hoping it's in the near future, it better be because we have applications out for grant funds. But um, I would expect it in a couple of weeks. Um, they got it back, but they have to deal with some technical questions. So, okay. so it's close for the first run of design. Yeah, it's close. Well, it looks like you are ready to have a motion to Someone? Second. Aye, aye. Commissioner Wong is talking about the motion to Aye. 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 Aye.